What an honor and a joy to be up here this morning um, just to celebrate our young people. We had our big give night. Uh, I forgot to say this in first service, um, but we had our big give night. We've been doing a speed light push, and our students raised, uh, with a lot of your help, raised almost $17,000. So yeah, that's a, awesome. But it wouldn't happen without you guys. Uh, you guys are amazing, and thank you for believing in the next generation. But man, I'm so humbled to be with you this morning. Did everyone make it in okay? Are we frozen? Do we need to turn up the heat? No? Turn down the heat? <laughs> uh, I've noticed that uh, I'm becoming a little soft. My blood is not as thick because I've accepted the Iowan way, and I'm slowly making my way south, so I keep saying I'll you know, state by state, I got to figure it out because I'm cold now. I shouldn't be cold. I'm from Minnesota, so got to keep moving south. But it's, uh, we're continuing a, a series, It's a Wonderful Life, uh, talking through the holidays, talking through our lives in the holidays. Pastor Jeff and um, Pastor Zach spoke, and so, man, I'm just excited for what God, ha- what God has this morning uh, for us. How many of you know that uh, the holidays are crazy? Crazy good, crazy bad, both sides of the coin. Family can be a little cray. I know mine is. That's probably what they're saying about me. And if, if you are sitting here and you're like, man, none of my family's crazy, you're probably it. <laughs> so... News flash. We'll pray for you after service. But the, the, the stress and the worry and the anxiety that comes with the holidays, it seems to be matching the joy and the peace and sometimes even more a little, little more powerful. But I believe this morning that God's word is true and God's word sets us free and he's going to share some things and speak and I'm going to get out of the way. Um, and so join me as we just pray. God, we invite you in this place. We thank you that your presence is already here, and we thank you that your presence brings peace and joy, purpose and love. And God, we pray that your, your truth would be spoken, and we thank you that, that there's power in that truth, and it sets us free. We praise you. And everybody said, amen. 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 So I'm talking worry, anxiety this morning, um, and so just some statistics for you, uh, anxiety has been on the rise for years. Uh, worry, anxiety, all these, these words that I'll use this morning kind of clumped together, but there was a poll by the American Psychiatric Association that said almost 40% of Americans are more anxious than they were at this time last year. 40%. 40% also said that they were at least uh, the same amount, they had a, the same amount of anxiety and worry than they did last year. The, the top three sources that this poll cited from people uh, of the, the greatest source of anxiety came from safety, health, and finances. Uh, 68% said keeping myself or my family safe um, or my health was, was the most. Uh, 67 just under that was expenses, paying the bills, money. Uh, 56% was politics. Uh, and interpersonal relationships followed at 50%. People are anxious about a lot of different things, worried about different things. The average, this blew my mind, the average high school student today has higher levels of anxiety than the average psychiatric patient in the early 50s. That's disheartening to me, and we see it all the time, and I know it's not just a youth thing. It's not just a youth struggle, but everyone has worry and fear and anxiety. I know it sometimes can build around the holiday season. Barnes and Noble even said that their sale of books that had to do with anxiety are up more than 25% just from last year alone. So people want to know about it, and I believe that God's Word, our, the, the Scripture uh, that's living and active, has that remedy for us this morning. And so just disclaimer, disclaimer, I'm not a therapist, I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a doctor. Um, I'm, I'm just a pastor, um, and I, I feel like God has led me to some things this morning. But what I do know is that when it comes to worry, fear, and, and anxiety especially, that it's not 100% just, phys- or just spiritual, excuse me. Anxiety is not just 100% 
spiritual. Sometimes in church you can show up and you're, you're trying to sing songs of peace and joy, especially around the holidays, and you're sitting there in fear and anxiety. And the church sometimes uh, may put this, or you may feel like uh, this pressure that, man, if I just had more faith or just prayed more, etc., that I should be better, and I'm not. And so it's, it, but there's, there's, physical, mental things that are going on with anxiety, worry, and fear. We know that we're, we're physical beings. But uh, the flip side of that is I know that anxiety is not uh, 100% just physical either. That there is spiritual things going on. I know that uh, God created us with a powerful mind that is connected to our bodies and connected to our souls, and Satan knows that as well, and he's trying to steal, kill, and destroy. And so I propose that this morning as we talk through uh, these issues that, that we would all agree that it is 100% physical and 100% spiritual. Uh, but I'm thankful for God that he is bigger than all these things. So we need to understand this morning the, the, the feeling of anxiety actually started out as an ally and not an enemy. You were created, we were created with something that you may have heard before that is called the fight or flight response. So when, for instance, me, you may call this irrational, but whatever, I'm deathly afraid of horses. They scare me. They're dangerous at both ends and unpredictable in the middle. <laughs> and so don't try to change my mind. So... But they have feelings. Yeah, feelings of murder <laughs> for me. Anyways, I see a horse and I was created to go, that is a risk, that is danger, that's stress. And so I have a physiological response in my brain that triggers a release of hormones that then prepares my body to either stay and deal with said horse, which is not the case a lot of times, or it prepares my body to flee in an appropriate manner. Uh, this anxiety response is, is normal. It, it, anything that you uh, in your, your body sees as a risk, sees as stress, it will trigger this response. So you may, uh, Pastor Jeff brought up one of the most hated and feared things is public speaking. So you could think of public speaking and you, the, the, it's starting to trigger this response. You know, you get, your muscles get shaky. Your vision kind of gets narrowed and, and blurred a little bit. You, your breathing is heavy. Your, your temperature rises. This is just a natural to response to risk. And, and, and you know, I, I believe that the body is priming your, uh, the, I mean, excuse me, this, this response is priming your body to help you better perform under pressure. It's a natural thing. But what is unnatural and what is, uh, is not correct is when this, this anxiety gets into an unhealthy, responsive manner, and it's being triggered in unhealthy ways and ex excessive ways. And so our goal isn't as people to completely eradicate all nervousness, all anxiety. That's not our goal. Our goal is just to make it healthy, make it our ally again. Um, anxious translated literally means to be pulled in different directions. The old English root of the word worry means to strangle. I know, and it, you may experience that too when you are feeling that, those feelings of anxiety and fear. It, it causes you to just feel like you're physically being strangled. And, and I know so many things around the holidays, even as we're reading through Luke um, for this kind of Christmas season. I know, and I think through that story, there's got to be a ton of stress and anxiety even in the Christmas story. And so how do we respond to it? even if it's big or small things. Dr. Walt Covert did a study a couple years back about things people worry about, and 92% of the things that people worry about were either imaginary, they never happened, or people couldn't control anyways. 92%. Only 8% of the things that we actually worry about have, an, have a real concern of actually being carried out. 8%. That's such a small thing. We worry about so many things, big and small, that, that we can't control anyways. We can't control anyways. We, we, in certain situa situations and scenarios, we ask these questions of what if? What if this happens? What if they reject me? What if I fail? What if, what if, what if? And we, our minds start to run and triggers this response and it only gets worse and worse as we think about it. And we worry and become anxious, and it can control us. See, I believe that 
worry and anxiety break two views in our lives. There's two broken views that we have because of worry and anxiety in our lives, regardless of any situation. And so the first broken view that we have is the broken view of what I hold. So in, Pastor Brian is going to come up and help me in a second. In, in youth, we love to have students come up front uh, and share what God is doing in their lives. We love to have them, you know, give their testimony or give a challenge uh, of what God's speaking to them in Scripture. But if you have a middle schooler or have been a middle schooler once, you know that's a little scary giving a middle schooler a mic or a high schooler who may not have a filter. It can get all over the place and a lot of times very entertaining. And so what we, Pastor Zach and I, you know, we, we try to, when we have a mic on a Wednesday, we love to give them a voice, but uh, we don't know what always is going to be said. And so I like to be able to hold the mic and almost do it like an interview style. And, and, and so, you know, Pastor Brian's going to help me this morning a little bit with it. So how are you this morning? I'm good. I'm worried you're comparing me to a middle school. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I brought you up. Thank, thank you. That's okay. Um, you probably weigh as much as a middle schooler. <laughs> Response. <is> probably true. <laughs> <laughs> so if I were to ask Pastor Brian a question, hey, what's your favorite Christmas snack or treat? Uh, I don't know the name of it. There may not be a name, but hands down, it's the cookies that have like the, the uh, Hershey kiss on top. Praise God. Yes. Praise the Lord. And if I were to continue to interview Pastor Brian, and I were to, maybe football comes up, and this fool wants to start talking about how the Hawkeyes are better than the Gophers, and they beat them, and all this stuff, I'd be able to go, nope, get behind me, Satan. Uh, you're not Satan. You know, I don't know. So, if we record that, I just call Pastor Brian Satan. Um, I'm fired. But I can, I can control and say, no, that's, I don't know if we should go that, because I feel personally re responsible for what I'm holding up here. I'm, I'm responsible for what's being said. I, I've been given the platform, we get kids up, but I, I'm the pastor. I'm in control, and me holding on to this and not letting it go gives me control, right? Give Pastor Brian a hand. Thanks for coming. Sorry I called you Satan. I love you. But if I can hold it, I must be in control of it. And I'm responsible for what's being said, so I must be in control of it. But sometimes we don't realize is that even though we think when I'm holding it, we think that's control, but a lot of times, with, especially with the mic and sound, there's somebody in the back that we always don't see sitting at the sound booth so that any moment they could take control Lights. It, it, it. <laughs> the fire alarm's about to sound. Pastor Weaver, emergency button. But, but I believe that in times, this reflects our Christian life a lot in our lives, is that responsibility is often confused with control. You see, everything that we have on this earth, your health, your finances, your family, Everything is a gift from God. It, the Bible talks about every good thing is from God. And so I know everything has been gifted to me. That doesn't mean I have control over it. Just because I'm holding it doesn't mean I'm controlling it. But God, in his graciousness, has said, hey, I'm giving you these things. I'm giving you responsibility. And I would go, great. I, I got this job. I'm with this. So I'm in control. Thanks for putting me in control, God. And I'm holding this thing, but I'm not actually controlling it. There's somebody that I can't always see that's controlling what I do see. Do you see where I'm going? And we have this broken view of what we're holding, what we're responsible for, what we should be stewarding that God has given us. We have a broken view because we worry and we're anxious. And it breaks this relationship between what we have, what we hold, and what we're in control of. Being anxious and worried makes us think that we're actually in control. And therefore, we worry even more when we're not in control at all. We worry about the smallest things and maybe even you have a worry and you're anxious about a big thing in your life, but let me remind you that even the biggest thing, the bi even if it's the size of the world, the Bible says that God holds the world in his hand. It's small. 
It's small to him. He's so big and so powerful, and he's in control, and I'm not. I'm holding it, but I'm not controlling it. We get this false view of control from worry and anxiety. The second thing that, the second broken view that worry and anxiety give us is the broken view of what I see. So what I hold and what I see are broken because of worry and anxiety. Pilots, when they're, they're being trained, they, they, they have to get trained on something called spatial disorientation. You may have heard of it before, maybe not. Um, it is a phenomenon that happens to a pilot when they're up in the air and maybe they're in the clouds, the thick clouds, maybe they're in a storm, maybe it's just dark out, but they can't fully see the horizon and they're kind of clouded and blinded a little bit and so their bodies start to physically say and feel like they're upside down. They're disoriented, so they, they now feel and saying, oh my gosh, I'm upside down or I'm going straight down. And so they freak out based on their feeling, and they will react and make decisions on how they feel and what they think they see, and it causes them to crash. And uh, see, they, every plane has multiple instruments. And somebody told me in the first service, which I love this, is that even in training, pilots will get a special like mask or hood that will, they won't be able to see anything except for the instruments. And they have these instruments and gauges, and they have these gauges, which is actually called an, an attitude adjuster. I find that so fitting. And that, those two gauges mirror each other and say, you're fine. You're right side up. Even though you're, you can't see it, you're good. Even though you feel it like you're upside down, you're not. And God has given us these gauges for our broken vision. You are sitting in the gauge right now, sitting next to a gauge by the family of God. He's given us his word. He's given us his spirit, as we'll talk about in a little bit, that we can look at and say, God, I'm feeling like I'm upside down. I'm feeling like I'm on a crash course right now. I can't see the horizon fully, but you know what? I can look at my gauges and go, it's going to be okay. All right, I got, God's in control. I got this. And so the pilots are taught, don't trust your feelings because they're not always true. Don't trust what you think you see. And when we, we worry about things and we, we're anxious about things and we, we let it snowball in our minds and we get so off track to reality and we start to make decisions off our broken view of what we're seeing around us. It can even cause us to push away God because we think we're seeing his hand hurting us instead of working for us. But it's up to the pilot. They get to make a decision based off of the gauge or their feeling. And we get to choose that. Will we make a decision based off of how we feel or what we think we see or the truth? There's an acronym that, that fear is false evidence appearing real. And we often believe our feelings and what we think reality is instead of the truth that God says. Because it's not because God didn't tell us the truth, it's because we didn't believe him. And we need these gauges, especially when worry and anxiety set off where we're actually, how we view things. And we base so many things off how we feel. The world loves to validate feelings. Whatever you feel is true. And you may be sitting in this service going, man, I, I'm, I'm feeling upside down. I'm feeling overwhelmed. I'm feeling like I can't see the light at the end of the tunnel. I can't see the horizon. I'm on a crash course. And I'm not saying this morning that those feelings aren't real. I've felt those myself when things go wrong or when I'm worrying about something. Those feelings are very real. But they're not always true. And that's what we try, we try to tell our high school and middle schoolers. You, your feelings are real, but they're not always true. They don't always represent truth well. Often worry and anxiety are great twisters and liars to us about what actually is going on or what will go on. Just like the study said, 92%. That 92% felt real of the things, but 92% was wrong. So we can't always 
trust our feelings. That's why anxiety and worry, it's a battlefield of the mind. No wonder Satan loves to plague our minds. In Proverbs 23, 7, for as he thinks in his heart, so is he. Proverbs 4, 23, guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. God gave us a connection of mind, body, and soul, and there's power in it, and Satan loves to attack and twist and make you feel, and make you feel, and make you feel, so you will end up acting and making decisions based off of false realities. But Paul, in Philippians, writing, gives us two very tangible and powerful ways we can fight against these broken views, fight against worry, and fight against anxiety. Turn with me into Philippians chapter 4, starting in verse 6. Paul Paul says, don't worry about anything. Other translations say, don't be anxious. Don't be worried about anything. Instead, pray about anything everything. Tell God what you need. Thank him for all he's done. Then, turn your neighbor and say then. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true, honorable, right, pure, lovely, admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all you learned and received from me, everything you heard from me and saw me doing. Then, turn your neighbor, say then. Then Then the God of peace will be with you. Paul has all the reason in the world while writing this letter to live the opposite. He is in prison writing this letter on his way to his death, which he, he, he eludes in other letters and even in this letter that it's my time's coming. He, know his, he knows this road, this prison road leads to death. I cannot think of a more anxious situation when I've been pretty much given a uh, number of days in a death penalty. And he's saying boldly, don't be anxious. Don't be worried. Pray about everything. The first way that we can fight worry and anxiety and fix these broken views is don't worry, pray. Could it be, Pastor Luke, that you just, this remedy that you're saying for something so strong and powerful as worry and anxiety could be so Sunday school as prayer? Oh, just pray more? Didn't you say that earlier? Well, I think sometimes we complain about our situation and call it prayer. I, th- I think sometimes we're subconsciously glorifying our enemy, glorifying our worry and anxiousness, and then trying to convince God to get on our side and calling it prayer. But we can get into this mode of, man, if I could just find the one, two, three, quick hit, powerful, the right sermon, the right verse, the right thing, the quick fix, then it will take it away. It couldn't be something as simple as prayer. But could it be something as simple as prayer that could be so powerful that could change our lives? Absolutely. Absolutely it could. My dad is the handiest guy I know, besides Richard. Richard's awesome. Handiest guy I know. I can build, fix, do anything. And so me, when I, you know, as a homeowner, when I have things that I need to fix or build, I'm calling him first because he's got the knowledge. But most importantly, why, do, why would I call him? Because I know he can help. And me, me calling him implies not just that he can help, but that he's able to do something, right? And so if I were to go to somebody else or not go to God with my worry and anxiety, isn't that implying that I'm implying that God can't do anything about it? But if I went to him first and I prayed, I am anxious, I am worried, and I went in prayer first, that would be me implying, saying, God, not only are you willing and able, you, you, you want to help me. You can. I'm giving you the power. See, I believe that prayer really, it puts God in charge. It puts God in charge of those situations. It's saying, I need you. I can't do this on my own. 
and lets us realize that we're not in charge. Prayer doesn't change God. Sometimes we think that if, if I'm praying, I can just convince God to get on my side or convince Him to heal me of anxiety, or convince me, Him to take away these circumstances and make everything perfect, and, and I just gotta convince Him to get on my team. And I gotta change His mind. No, prayer doesn't change God, prayer changes us. Because when I get in a praying posture first, I'm saying, God, you're in charge. That does something to my spirit. That gives me a confidence that the God who holds my whole world in his hands, he's willing and able, he cares and he knows. And he can take that away from me. He can take that word. I can give that to him. It changes me, gives me trust, gives me faith, gives me hope, lets me know I'm not alone. See, worrying is asking our fears what will happen in the future. Praying is asking our Father what will happen in the future. You're either praying to your worry or you're praying to your Father. Verse 7 says, Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live. God, this stuff is crazy. Life is crazy. Family is crazy. This, I, I'm so worried, the anxious, all, everything seems to be going wrong. I'm on a crash course. I feel like I'm upside down but I have peace because you're with me. I don't understand it. I don't know why, but I have peace. Surpasses greater than anything we can understand. It doesn't make sense. Therefore, to me, it's, it's not a feeling. It can't be a feeling. It's much deeper and more powerful than that. Even though I don't get it, I got it. See, peace doesn't depend on what's going on around you. It depends on what's going on inside of you. Think about this, Daniel was thrown into the lion's den and the king was in his palace. Daniel had peace with the lions, but the king was up all night in turmoil. It doesn't matter your situation, you could be in the palace or in the lion's den. But Daniel had it in here. He knew his God, he knew his God and who his God was. And so he didn't let anything going on around infect in here. And I may not be able to always control what's going on around me, but I can always control how I respond. I can always control how I respond in here. Am I going to let worry and anxiety speak to me and tell me what to do and act on my feelings? Or I'm going to sit and I'm going to pray and say, God, you're bigger than this. I need you. Give me peace. And it will guard us. I love that. It will guard our hearts and minds. Verse 8, and now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true honorable, right, pure, lovely, admirable. Think about the things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all you learned to receive from me everything you heard from me and saw me doing. Then, turn your neighbor and say, then, then the God of peace will be with you. The second thing Paul gives us is to fix our thoughts on. I believe in this, he's saying fix as in fixate or focus, but I believe that there are thoughts that we have that need fixing. There are thoughts that we have, just like we talked about broken views of what we hold and what we see. There, there are certain thoughts in our minds that we have that need fixing. These thoughts of the what ifs and the building and what, uh, in playing out certain scenarios in our heads, we need to fix those. I, I love the, the translation of this, this verse. It, it says, don't be worried or don't be anxious. Never does God say, don't feel afraid or feel worried. He says, don't be it. I believe that there's, there's a difference in feeling something and being something. F I, I, I will feel fear sometimes. I will feel that. that. It is a real feeling, right? But it's not always true. And so I have now the choice to become that fear. <laughs> to be it, to accept the anxiety. Don't be anxious doesn't mean I'll never feel anxious. It just means I'm not going to stay that way. I'm not going to feel upside down sometimes, but I'm not going to act on it. Our minds are so powerful, and we can have these full conversations with ourselves, and I believe that we, we listen to ourselves way more than we speak to ourselves. And when you get in a conversation in your own head and listen to yourself and start following what yourself is saying to yourself, it's not always good. It's not always good. It's not always the right direction. 
and we let our minds run and run, and it just makes things worse. And so I need to stop listening to myself and start talking to myself. I talk to God first, and then I talk to myself. I pray, but I fix these thoughts, and how do I fix them? Is I tell myself the truth. I fix my thoughts, and I fix my thoughts on what is true. That's the first thing. What is truth? That is scripture. I fix my thoughts on what is true. Yes, God, my whole world is literally crumbling, but you are still on the throne. And you use all things for the good of those who love you and are called according to your purpose. What is right, what is pure, what is lovely. I start talking to myself. My thoughts are running all over the place, but I'm saying, "Uh uh-uh, my God is good. We just sang about the King of Kings. That's my God. That's my Father. And I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna let my, my feelings just run my life. He'll never leave me. Think of things excellent and worthy of praise. Worship team, you could come at this time. Do you know what this list reminds me of? It doesn't remind me of a person I could sit next to. Yes, there's truth in it, and there's the, the, these things represent God's word, but I think the most thing that this list that we need to fix on, this is Jesus. Think about this list, what is true? Jesus says, I am the truth. Honorable, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent. Jesus is worthy of praise. So I fix my thoughts on Jesus. I let him tell me the truth. And I love this. So the the first then that I had you say said, all right, if I pray to God, if I take this to him, then God's peace will be with me. I'll have peace that I don't really understand. But the second one, Paul says, hey, if you just fix your thoughts, if you start focusing on the truth, speaking to yourself the truth, fixing your thoughts on Jesus, it says, then the God of peace will be with you. I'll have peace, and I'll know that the God of peace is with me. What a one-two punch to Satan's schemes of getting in our minds. God's peace with me, and the Prince of Peace with me. And I never have to worry or be anxious. Because peace isn't a feeling. It's not, it's a person. It's a choice to pray and fixate whatever's going on. Isaiah 26 puts it all together. You will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you and whose thoughts are fixed on you. I trust in God by praying. I put my trust in Him, you're you're in control. And I fix my thoughts on you, and you're going to have perfect peace. John 14, I'm leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. And then the peace I give is a gift the world can't give. So don't be troubled or afraid. It doesn't look like the world's peace. See, the world's, there's a difference between the world's peace and God's peace. The world's peace depends on resources, but God's peace depends on relationship. I can do everything I can and work my whole life to put resources in place, my 401, get my finances in order, try to fix this relationship, marry the right person, do this, do that, and I get my worldly resources in order and I still am not in control. I don't have peace. The world's peace depends on just nothing going on around. Once I get everything under control, that's when peace happens. It's so external. But God's peace is dependent on relationship. I have a relationship with Jesus, the Prince of Peace, who is peace and gives me peace that's not of the world. It says we won't even understand it. But I have it. I don't have to work for it. It's given as a gift. Jesus is the greatest gift as he died on the cross for our lives and set us free from worry and anxiety. We don't have to worry about tomorrow. You don't have to worry about today. You don't have to worry about yesterday. If I have a relationship with the Prince of Peace, worldly peace comes from the absence of trouble, but godly peace comes in the midst of it. And the peace of God doesn't mean the absence of trial, but it means the presence of peace during trial. Would you stand with me all across this room? There's something so powerful about the presence of God. His promises through scripture, I will walk with you. I will walk with you through high waters, fire, valleys, I'm with you. I'm with you. I can trust in you. That's my comfort. That's my strength. That's my peace. Would you bow your heads all across this room? 
just take a moment to let the Spirit of God speak to you. He wants to give you peace today. Confidence in His nearness to you and His plan for you. If you're in this room and you would say, man, Pastor Luke, I, 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 I think about it. Maybe I, this is my first time in church. Maybe it's my hundredth. But I've never fully given Jesus my life. I've never, he came and died for me to be in my life, to set me free, to give me salvation. And I've never given him my life. And that's why I don't have peace. And you want, you want not just peace, but you want Jesus. Would you just, as a sign to God of surrender, say, man, that's me. And you raise your hand. Nobody looking around. You'd say, that's me. I see your hand. That's me. I see your hand. Yeah, absolutely. I want that. I see your hand. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Now, for anyone else, you say, man, I have a situation. I got a circumstance. I feel like I'm upside down. I got this worry. This anxiety is unhealthy, and I just need the Prince of Peace. I need, I, I need to pray more. I gotta, there's some broken views. There's some broken thoughts that I got to fix. And I got to fix on Jesus. If that's you and the and Spirit's moving you to that, would you just raise your hand? Say, that's me. Yeah, there's hands up all over the place. Thank you, Jesus, that your presence is here. I'm just going to pray over us, and the altars are open. And I invite you to take a step towards Jesus. There's nothing special going on down here. It's just a physical step of what's going on internally. It's ex an external step of what's going on inside of you, what God is doing in your heart. And that gives you anxiousness. Some people are already anxious, thinking, I got to go up front. Man, God has peace for you. And if you need prayer about anything, we'd love to pray with you. If you made a decision for Jesus, I'd love to just talk with you and pray with you at the Fresh Start Center right out in the lobby. We have a gift for you. But as I pray, we're just going to sing and talk about and thank God for His presence. So Jesus, we thank you this morning that your presence is peace. Your presence is joy, that there's power and freedom in this place. God, that no matter what's going on around us, it can, it, we could have had the worst week of our lives this week, but we can stand on the truth and the promise that you're with us. We may not fully understand it, but God, we, we, we come to you, we run to you, Jesus. Help fix our broken thoughts. God, help us realize that you are in control. We can trust in you and stop taking so much control of our own lives. When we give these things to you, when we lay them at your feet, Jesus, as we worship you and elevate you above ourselves, we praise you, God, in your holy name. Would you just take a moment with Jesus before you leave?